you've been paying attention throughout this whole webinar series, you may remember that you've heard about summer youth employment programs or SYEPs twice before. But just in case you were distracted by your email during those other sessions, I'm going to start with a sort of brief reminder about what an SYEP is before I get to the, the sort of new content. Um, so almost all of the 30 largest cities run some kind of SYEP and a lot of the mid-sized cities as well. They typically last between six to eight weeks, often serving ages 14 to 21, although there's some variation on both the top and the bottom end uh, across the country. And as the name suggests, the core programming element is a job. So most often they involve government or nonprofit work like urban renewal projects, being camp counselors, working in government offices. Um, but a lot of the programs also place youth in healthcare, retail and other private sector positions. Uh, the nonprofit agencies that actually implement the program locally often include some other program elements. So it's, it's a little more structured as a youth development uh, program than if you just went out and got your own job over the summer. Now, there's never enough funding to serve every young person who could potentially benefit. And so a lot of cities use random lotteries as a way to fairly allocate a limited number of slots. So that helps to ensure that everyone has equal access to the opportunity. And it also sets researchers up to be able to rigorously estimate the effects of the program by comparing uh, the group that gets offered the slot or the treatment group with the group that doesn't or the control group. And we can con uh, track both sets of youth in administrative data, compare their outcomes and know that that's the effect of the program itself. Uh, so what you've seen in the past is that um, in New York, researchers found uh, the SYEP there decreased incarceration by 10%, decreased mortality by almost 20%, which they think is driven largely from a reduction in homicide. Uh, in Boston, it's a slightly different set of outcomes, but similar message, big declines in charges for violence and property crime. So in addition to these two, uh, to these two studies, which you've seen presented before in this series, I have prior work studying a program called One Summer Chicago Plus across a couple of different years. In 2012, I found a 42% decline in violent crime arrests uh, in the year after the program. And in 2013, I repeated the study, but with a new cohort that involved much more criminally active youth, finding a similar decline in violent crime arrests of about a third. So that's already a lot of evidence about SYEPs, but wait, there's more. So in this third study, which is the my emphasis today, um, I had two more pieces of evidence. Uh, in the first, I look again at the Chicago program, but this time as it's scaled up, basically tripling its uh, initial size. And what I found is again, a large reduction in arrests. So this time it was more concentrated on drug and other arrests, but that's likely partly, at least partly, because um, 2015 had historically low violent crime rates. And so there wasn't really that much room to fall in terms of violence that year. And then the last study was a Philadelphia's uh, program, which they call Work Ready. And this one operates at scale across the whole city. And there too, I found similar drops in all arrests and in juvenile incarceration. Now, of course, these are all slightly different outcomes. They cover slightly different time periods, although in almost all of the cases, the declines continue after the program ends, right? So it's not just a question of keep using youth, keeping youth busy over the summer, but rather they're taking something with them that changes their future behavior. So across all of these studies, they're not exactly comparable. But if you look at this set of evidence, everything on your screen together, it tells a really consistent story, which is that SYEPs reduce violence and criminal justice contact. And this is maybe a little bit surprising because a lot of other programs have had trouble replicating effects in new settings, right? So you try something in one place, it doesn't work as well in another. And so it's natural to ask why the effects are so consistent across time and scale and context. And so part of the explanation seems to be that Unlike a lot of other education and youth development programming, where it seems like the devil is really in the details, with SYEP is it looks like it doesn't matter all that much when you vary the program structure or who's implementing the program. And there's kind of two pieces of evidence for this claim. The first comes from looking at treatment effects across the different local agencies within a city that implement the program. And these agencies have a lot of variation in who the staff are, how much experience they have, how big the organization is, how it works out the matching between youth and jobs, all sorts of implementation decisions. And in Chicago and part of Philadelphia, youth didn't choose their local provider, they were placed there by lottery. And so we can actually test whether treatment effects vary across the different providers. And the answer is that they don't. There's no significant variation in treatment effects across providers, 
which suggests that it's the basic approach of the program that matters, not the staffing or the organizational capacity or the sort of details of the professional development that's offered. The second piece of evidence is that we've tested different versions of the program. So some with and without social emotional learning, some with and without a separate adult mentor and civics curriculum. And I'll say these results are a little bit less clear. I think there's some indication that the extra training and support does help increase the program's impact, but the differences are kind of hard to detect in the data. And in fact, places like New York don't have those extra pieces, but still reduce crime and violence. And so at a minimum, it doesn't seem like these elements are central to the program success, even if there's some possibility that they help magnify effects. So it seems like on the program side, SYEPs are sort of unusually replicable and scalable, at least within the big cities that have tried them, that have the infrastructure to implement them, all of which are operating programs with a lot of planning and care, right? I don't mean to say implementation quality doesn't matter at all, just the variation that we see in practice doesn't seem to matter. But, and this is sort of a key but here, who you serve does matter. So you sometimes hear policy discussions about how some youth are too far gone or it's too late to change their criminal behavior. And I think that may be true for some interventions, but here, as it turns out, it's actually the young people at the highest risk of negative outcomes like violence and other crime that have the biggest declines in response to program participation. And so I'm gonna show you this kind of visually in a graph. So each dot here is a program effect for a particular group and outcome. The blue dots are Philly's Work Ready program. The red triangles are Chicago's 2015 uh, One Summer Plus program. And the outcomes are anything that the program significantly affected. So different types of crime, incarceration, and so forth. Along the x-axis, the horizontal axis, I'm showing the average outcome. So the amount of crime or the amount of incarceration for the control group. In other words, the sort of level of risk of these outcomes in the absence of the program. So the fact that the blue dots are on the left and the red triangles are on the right indicates that the young people who applied to Chicago's program were generally more involved in crime than those who applied to Philly's program. And in fact, that makes sense because Philadelphia's program has universal eligibility across the city, while Chicago's is purposefully targeted to those at higher risk of violence. And so we can sort of see here that that targeting is working. But the really crucial pattern is what happens on the y-axis, the vertical axis, which shows the program effects. So what you see as you move left to right is that as the risk of negative outcomes gets bigger, the program effects also get bigger. They get more negative, bigger decreases in crime. And in fact, that relationship is basically linear. You can kind of draw a line through it. Higher risk corresponds to consistently bigger program effects. Now, what I'm showing you here is just the main significant effects for the two new experiments that I mentioned from this paper. Now let me add all of the significant main effects for the, all of the other studies that I showed you before. And you see that the effects basically all lie along the same line. It's a really consistent pattern. Now you also sort of see the mirror image across the axis of that pattern for the two adverse effects there, the uh, green diamonds, um, which are some longer term increases in property crime in Chicago. Those show up within the subgroup of the um, of youth whose employment actually benefits. So on average, these programs don't actually help employment. There's some group that actually does see an increase in employment, and the property crime increase is concentrated among that group, suggesting that maybe what's going on is that these youth are traveling to richer neighborhoods for work where there's more stuff to steal. But everything that's below the, the uh, zero line there uh, are, is much more socially costly. So declines in violence, incarceration, mortality, that all sort of has this consistent uh, pattern in terms of risk and responsiveness. And we see that hold up even when we break things down even further by subgroup. So here I now have a separate marker for different types of individuals across papers. So some of these are boys with and without criminal histories, all sorts of different divisions that these uh, papers report. And we see here the same linear effect, right? There doesn't even seem to be any leveling off really. It's just a proportional increase in program effects uh, as risk goes up. And that sort of pattern of proportionally increasing program effects has important implications for targeting and scaling, right? So for policymakers, it's worth thinking carefully about how you set your eligibility criteria, as well as what this means for how big your program can feasibly get. So for example, if you're already serving all of the crime prone young people in your city, expanding to serve additional youth might mean serving youth at almost no risk of crime. 
Now that might have other benefits, right? You might sort of want to generate income transfers for that group, but it's not going to have much of a crime benefit. Conversely, if you're serving young people at relatively low risk of violence, but you want to be reducing violence, those people might respond, right? Everyone is sort of lying underneath the, the zero line there. Um, but you might get more bang for your buck from adjusting who your program serves, even without changing the scale, right? Just sort of adjusting the targeting. Now, of course, this targeting recommendation has caveats, right? It might be harder and more expensive to recruit and serve criminally involved youth. And you probably need to find local providers who know how to do it successfully. It's not always an easy task. Um, it's also possible that peer composition is an important part of how the program works, right? And if so, making really massive shifts where the whole population changes might have unintended consequences. Although I'll say we, we've tested it in Chicago with a population that's about half from the criminal justice system and half not. Um, and so that's a lot more uh, criminal involvement than in most cities. So there's a, there's a lot of room to move relative to what most cities are, who most cities are serving. Um, and then lastly, it's worth noting this higher risk group that if you sort of shift this targeting to a higher risk group, that's different than the group I mentioned that benefits on employment, right? So the group that benefits on employment tends to be less involved with the criminal justice system, more engaged with school, younger, potentially more female and Hispanic. And so there's a trade-off that requires a decision there, right? You have to choose as a policymaker what outcome you really wanna target and then make your eligibility choices accordingly. Okay, so to, to wrap up, um, it's pretty rare to find results that are this robust across settings. And I think it's especially promising that the people who are the worst off are those helped the most, right? Because that means we can spend uh, public dollars efficiently, efficiently while also promoting equity. Now, of course, SYEPs serve a limited group of people, right? They're for high school kids during the summer, generally. And it's not entirely clear how lasting their effects are. And so this is not the only solution we should be looking for. We should keep pursuing a whole range of ways to reduce violence. But as we do, I think this is a useful frame to think about sort of which approaches can we find that are replicable, that are scalable, and that can help generate cost-effective change. Thanks a lot.